well. It is um, Thursday, and uh, we're running a little late today, primarily because in getting here, um, we had a couple things we had to do. We had to like get into the wormhole. We had to go to Fantasy Age, which is in a totally different time-space continuum, and then we had to head over to Modern Age, which is in the future, but just a little light to the future to the left to get guests, um, not because we had to hunt for them, but because that's the kind of service that we provide at Thursdays. We sent a limo and, uh, you know, they went to a, a beauty day, they went to the salon and uh, now they're back, they're rested and ready to talk to you. And it's our friend, Ren LeBeau and our other friend, Malcolm Shepard. They're both here. Uh, let me show you what they look like. Hey friends. <laughs> How are you doing? Not too bad. Um, yeah. I'm on my side because I uh, hurt my back and it's pinched some nerves to my leg. So I am just taking it easy. You know, and that's, you know, we, we, we strive for comfort. So you just relax and you chill out. Um, Ren, what have you pinched? What have I pinched? Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, my lower back when I was carrying too much in high school, and they shot electrodes through my back, and it's oh. all been downhill from there, really. Wow, okay. Well, that does sort of make me feel a little bit like it's on topic, <laughs> because one of the things we're talking about is the cyberpunk slice. And Ooh. why are we talking about it? Because it's now available in print. It is available. We've got it up on... Uh, Drive through RPG mm -hmm. in PDF. Uh, we, we've got it in PDF. We got a PDF plus a soft cover premium book deal for thirty-two dollars mm. and ninety cents. Uh, or you can just pick up the POD, drop in that. Mm. Do do. Yeah, and of course hey. we do have some copies uh, available from our store too. Do we not? We sure do. Um, that was up. Next is our yeah. So we so here's the thing. This, these are collectors' items, and here's why. We went to Gen Con and did a special print run. It looked beautiful. I know because I've licked each one. And as a bonus, we will like it's only like twenty more dollars, uh, and we will unlick them. I'm kidding. No licking has been done. Um, but check that out. That is 1995. You can pick that up there. You can go to the drive-through RPG. Uh, link and um and pick it up now here's the thing do you feel like i feel like when i think of cyberpunk in general it's it's of course perfect any time of the year but there's a special feel that i feel like october uh, being that this is the sixth day of halloween um mm -hmm. we we can have a lot of fun with this like this mm -hmm. can be especially given that it will um influence your your modern age campaign you can add elements from it uh you can kind of like i could go through and just pick things that i liked i wouldn't necessarily have to immerse my whole modern age campaign or go all in right malcolm that yeah, that's true and like for example one of the uh ways you might use it is less for near future and more for kind of like a secret science modern campaign right Ooh, yeah yeah uh, which is the kind of thing you see you know you'll see it in a lot of marvel type media where you know most people are at the same technology level as us but you have people who uh who have access to better things right uh yeah. to enhancements and uh you know and of course do you have elements like uh corporate intrigue which we have fully matured into as a civilization um so it's no longer science fiction and that's the thing that i think is always the tricky thing with a cyberpunk genre is that we are constantly catching up with it um right. in many ways not necessarily in some of the big tropey ways right like walking around with fully functional steel uh steel chrome prosthetics and things like that you know we're yeah. not plugging our brains right into computers but that's not the whole of the genre and in many ways the uh social aspects of it um have become very true one of the interesting yeah. quotes about um william gibson said about the sprawl trilogy which is of course you know neuromancer and its sequels 
um, was that every it was his response to the fact that he uh, that cyberpunk future seemed so dismal. And he said, well, you know, um, at the time, I thought it was positive because there was still a civilization after the Third World War. Right. Oh, I see. I see another, you know, another kind of configuration of uh, politics that we get to enjoy even now. That is true. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, and honestly, what's interesting, I will say this, that as chaotic, as uh, alarming and distressing as many may find what's going on in the world today, there have been studies that show sort of the engaging in tabletop role play around those issues and around that like really does something good for your for your brain like it allows you to kind of feel as though um or i identify with aspects that are in your control um so you know i, I used to be somebody who was like you know no, i don't want to have i don't want to play today in my in my games um but you you know you might consider it i want to also uh do a quick rundown of our chat we've got so many of our friends are here I want to do it real quick. Uh, a shout out to Soylencer. Uh, Soylencer, you are so fun on Twitter. Like you were just literally like, uh, it's almost as though you are a paid plant. Uh, <laughs> you're just fantastic. I really appreciate interacting with you. Uh, to answer your qu your question real quick, uh, same versions. There's nothing different about the two uh, 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 print on demand. Uh, I mean, I, I believe we may even have used. If not, it was you know, it looks the same. Maybe it was a different uh, print-on-demand provider. But... There is a single erratum. Oh, there is. I, I'm lying. I'm so sorry. <laughs> there is a single erratum, um, and which I think, uh, which I believe has been resolved on drive-through. And I'll tell you that erratum. Um, and that is for, I believe, the cyborg talent. Uh, it mistakenly lists a communication to prerequisite when it's supposed to be constitution to. Okay. Gotcha. Soylencer, did you hear that? <laughs> I just want to make sure. And, uh, you know, uh, Soylencer shares, you know, I have a PDF already, print for learning and exploring, digital for play. Mine, that's my preference too, uh, th that way as well. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, you know, certainly we are, uh, we're nothing if not honest. <laughs> uh, he lied. I'm just kidding. Let's see. I want to say hey to Duke. Uh, Stan's here as well. Um, we've got uh, Brian F. Irving's here. We've got the crew. I'm really excited about that. Um, as you pop in, and or if you're here now and you're hanging out in the background, um, say how do you do. Uh, I've got a couple things I want to talk about related to the the age uh, sort of uh, company or the age you know family of of uh, titles in the green. Ronin Library, and one of them is um, the the Expanse. Uh, it is this. It's about a space thing. It's like ships, and you, you probably haven't heard of it yet. But uh, uh, it is a big deal, and it's uh, uh, we've got streamers streaming it twenty four seven. It, there's not a and everywhere across the globe. There is somebody streaming something about the Expanse, and we love it. Uh, we've got something really awesome cooking. Our friends over at the Facebook group. They are, um, it is the community fan group um, or the fan community for uh, the uh, RPG. And we are stoked to be collaborating with them. Folks have turned in uh, a one a, a one shot and we're going to be reviewing them. The community is going to vote for the one they like the best. And then we're going to play it. And it's going to be awesome. The way that we're doing this is I wanted to do it a little differently. You know, I think that our team... When you are the developer of a product, it is you're always sort of hustling, running the game, doing the thing. And I wanted to flip it and have some a, a GM with a cast that is sort of people that are made up of you know the developers and some uh, some special guests. So that'll be a lot of fun. We're going to get back to you with some specific dates, but we are very uh, very excited about that. And so keep your eyes peeled for that little bit of age. Um, now. Malcolm, is there any other pieces that we want to kind of cover about the cyberpunk slice, near futures, and hackable selves for modern age? Because we've talked about this quite a bit, but I'm happy to repeat. Yeah. Well, I guess I will give it a once-over. Um, 
just to shake some details yeah. loose. So, yeah. you know, so there's no, um, so there's no assumed setting for this. Um, it's a general, it's general coverage of the genre. And we kind of went for a functionalist sort of approach, which means that um, enhancements don't net really depend so much on what kind of technology they use. They depend more on what they can do, right? Um, now, Steve Kenson worked on that section and building it up from some prior rules that we'd had uh, developed in the Modern Age Companion and in the Threefold Setting book. And so we took that and then we tweaked it to make it more generically cyberpunk. Um, but this, uh, there's a wide range of options. So if you want to play an entirely artificial person, like a replicant, um, you can do that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, if you want to play, you know, if you want to play a metal robot or a cyborg or just a regular person, all of those are possible. Um, and there are various gears you can flip to make um enhancements um you know like uh strong artificial limbs and stuff um you know more or less prevalent uh there's of course you know rules for hacking including options for hacking other people's brains if they're hooked up um a lot of gear um i think the distinctive things um compared to comparable offerings in this space um are uh, <laughs> nice <laughs> first of all uh one of the things that i i i, I kind of liked was uh, we threw in some rules for how branding works um we sort of ported over the reputation honorific system to make a system for branding because that's one of the things in the genre right is control of corporations and the media presentation of things being used as the description of the thing um that's actually like an old school like uh turkey city writers workshop uh cyberpunk writing technique um i come into the genre from having studied science fiction in school so these little yeah. nerdy bits uh pop up for me so there's the branding. Friend, we we depend on you for the nerdy bits uh, uh yes we expect um that. so there's the branding stuff which is kind of supposed to you know replicate that flavor um, you know, like when uh, Will and Gibson in Mona Lisa Overdrive has the uh, Simpsons star being followed by, it's called just a brown drone, right? <laughs> and because we know what their coffee makers look like, we get a sense of what this drone looks like. And I think it's just the coolest thing. So I tried to get that kind of vibe. Um, and then the other stuff is just a discussion of automation because it's something that's very we're very close to now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have cars that sometimes they can drive themselves. Um, that's right. There's there's a great deal of rail system automation now and things like that. So we discuss what that means and we have systems for it um, that range from this helps you a little bit to well, <laughs> okay. So in modern age, of course, we have the three modes. Uh, we have gritty, pulpy, and cinematic. Um, now, the funny thing is that automation, based on the level of realism, um, the less realism, the worse automation is. Uh, because if you went with what we will probably be able to achieve um, with things like um, automated sighting and firearms and automatic driving and all of these things, um, then you just wouldn't have a playable game on, in its action adventure beats. Um, is everything and I noticed a little sidebar. <laughs> we have a gritty option for automation, but we also have the super gritty option for automation, uh, which we don't recommend you use by default. Where if a drone shoots you, it automatically hits you all the time, right? Right. Because yeah. because that they can make things that do that. Um, Right. I mean, currently, one of the things I was doing my research is currently, I guess there's a, a kind of sight uh, lower receiver combination that you can get that will uh, paint the basically your uh, you hold down the trigger, um, you point it and then it will paint the target and identify it. And then it won't release the round until you're until you're lined up properly. Right. So that's, you know, the old, uh, what's called smart gun, the smart gun in a lot of cyberpunk genre stuff. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So we already have all that, and it can really ruin our fun, you know, uh, metal arms punching through walls action adventure stuff. So we give you ways to kind of moderate it and make excuses for it and things like that. So I guess those are the two things that I think are distinctive. That and the fact that artificial characters um, are pretty well integrated. Um, now, when you we say pretty well integrated, you mean you mean that they're that they as a as a topic. They're, they're in, treated as a well. I mean, if you want to play a replicant or yeah, an embodied right. AI or something like that, the tools are there, um, and they're pretty smoothly uh, gotcha. thrown into character creation, so you don't have to do anything too strange. Gotcha. Yeah, right. But other than that, like it's just it's a set of rules. It's got all the mainstays, right? It's got uh, different options for hacking, and you know some futuristic vehicles and weapons and gear and a bunch of stuff. And it's in a kind of compact shape. So we're talking about a, uh, how long is it again? I think it's 50 odd pages soft cover. Right. I believe you are correct. But uh, you just you know, kind of slap that on top of your modern age core and you have a uh, functional cyberpunk. That's 60 pages. Okay. 60 pages. Well, there you go. Yep. Yep. So that so we're talking about the fact that drive through RPG, print on demand, cyberpunk slice, near futures, and hackable selves for mm -hmm. modern age. Uh, author Steve Kenson, Malcolm Shepard. We've got links in chat as well as our show notes. If you are uh, checking out the Twitter, you, if you came here via the tweets, you will see also that we've attached um, oh, links to also our stuff in the gross. Uh, Garby Green Run in an online store, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> uh, everyone's like, what the gross? Um, it's the Green Run in an online store. That link as well in chat and in our show notes. So check it out. Um, it is, uh, and I know people have been really excited about it and they wanted to pick it up. And uh, we've also got the uh, seven copies. I believe it's seven. We might actually be down some because that's the way this happens. We kind of do a QVC moment and I'm like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. we're sold out. But um, if that should happen, yeah. if you're just well, like, I really, really need is I... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, the other difference too is I think there's an ISBN on... And not a soul the, uh, understands on runs, right? Yeah. If you are, if you're really a big fan of uh, of data science, you definitely want to get Nicholas a the Green Ronin store. Hey, I'm sorry, old friend Nicholas is here, <laughs> and uh, it's so great. What I showed up late. <laughs> uh, we're talking about Cyberpunk Slice, and it is a, of course. Uh, let's start over. Nicholas is here, so we want to do this from the beginning. Um, all right, back to places. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, good to see you, my friend. I'm glad you're here. Um, you arrived uh, just in time, and um, thank you, Malcolm, for you know for the update on that. I want to um, encourage everybody. To, you've got questions, you can send us a tweet. Uh, if you've got questions in the chat. Go ahead and uh, drop them in there, and we'll kind of address them towards the uh, end of the program because we've got to talk with our special guest who's been sitting here just staring at us. And I'm, I, you know, <laughs> Ren, yeah, Ren, I have to tell you something. Um, you know, years ago when I first started uh, here at Green Ronin, you were one of the first people that I interacted with, uh, you know, in the community, and you were just so gracious, so thoughtful, just super fun. And, uh, it's been a, a delight. You have been such a supporter, such a, a contributor. And, uh, even just from the hanging out and chat and giving us the business and, uh, you know, uh, having fun with our, our, uh, live streams, uh, and as a, as somebody participating as a, as a published, you're a publisher, like, or you, you were a, a published developer through the age creators. And that I have published some things on drive through RPG. Yeah, I'll take that. That's right. Well, let's talk about this. You have through the age creators Alliance published mm -hmm. three different adventures um, and no more than three, right? Yeah. I've seen that here mm -hmm. and we've got links. Of course, we'll share some more, but um, tell me a bit about what those, what are, what did you, what did you publish? What's the world that you built? Okay. Uh, well, hello. Uh, thank you for building me up so high. I, I, oh, uh, hopefully I can keep it plateaued from here on <laughs> out. Um, uh, but I made uh, a setting that I've been working on for a couple of years. It is uh, a baby of mine. And um, 
I made it specifically for Fantasy Age. Uh, it's called Viteoth. Uh, Viteoth. And um, it's the setting that I run my uh, home game, Fantasy Age game, in that I've been running for about three years. Um, it's uh, Viteoth Adventures uh, are just adventures that take place inside that setting. Um, okay. Viteoth Adventures themselves are short adventures that are, should take ideally an afternoon, like four, or five, four to five hours. Each one. Uh, testing doesn't always go that way, but you know, I'm, I'm, it's that's why we play test. That's right. Well, so uh, real quick, I I, I don't want to throw you off your uh, off your spiel, sure. but you you ran play tests, you you know, and and you. It's almost as though this is an actual real published thing, and like are you like you're just making a billion dollars like any other publisher in the TTRPG <laughs> space, and is that right? That's exactly that correct? what the royalty report on Royal Drive Through RPG says is. That's here right. You go That's have right. all the money. <laughs> have all the monies. Uh, you know, joking aside. I love that you play tested that, that, you know, that is something that I think, you know, folks who are participating in, in, um, in programs like this may think, oh, I'm not going to, I'm just going to kind of do my thing, but it is, it really is the a pathway to truly being a published, you know, developer. It's, it's the real deal. Uh, you get actual money, you need to report it. And, um, and you didn't, and that's why the police are coming right now to your home. I hear them. Uh, <laughs> that'd be me. Um, uh, Canadian they're not coming people. for me, but I live on the way to the hospital. I see. I see. One hospital. I see. I see. <laughs> so. fun. Um, yeah, fun and cheery. Okay, so here's the thing I want to do real fast. Let me. I'm going to actually pull this up because I want to get into um, the actual meat of the matter. I want to talk about the various adventures. And let's start with this one. Is it the right one? Who will know? It is the right one. Here you are, my friend. It has the number one on it. It has the number one, which I really appreciate your labeling here. It's very uh, it's very easy for me to follow, especially since there's only three. I'll get a little more confused when you go over five. But uh, talk exactly. to me about the North Wall Patrol. North Wall Patrol was the very first one I made. Uh, it's actually also the very first Fantasy Age adventure I ever wrote. Um because uh, for years before that, I was playing Dragon Age. And uh, this was, I think I had heard so very long ago. I can't remember how long ago now. It was, I think it was when still Dragon Age was the only Age game. Um, that Fantasy Age was going to come around and that they were going to do a community content program for it. So I decided to get on it early. And I got some friends together and we uh, ran this little adventure. It has changed quite a bit uh, in the couple of years that I've let it sort of stew. Um it's, uh, you know, I think I did pretty good. I think I did okay. pretty good. So talk to me about, um, that's interesting. So we did talk about back in the day, this is before, before I was here, tabletop test drive. How did, how did you do you as well? Um, we, uh, I think that we made the announcement and then there was sort of an incubation period. We'll call it uh, some time to sort of. Now, and you took advantage of that time to let this marinate and kind of improve on, you know, sort of the, the pieces and you, it sounds like you did some of that play test notion. Can you tell me a bit about what it was that, um, that evolved in that period of time? Like what were the things that you had to kind of tweak and, you know, fulfill and sort of adjust? Hmm. Well, uh, fantasy age is goodness, like six years old now. Mm hmm. Um, and so plenty of books have come out in that time, so it has been growing alongside those. Uh, I started it with just the basic rulebook, and I think one of the first things that stuck out to me was that I really liked how Fantasy Age has the sort of themed arcana. And, yeah. And um, there's, like, the fire arcana and the fate arcana, the heroic arcana, or the uh, later later in the companion, the death arcana. Um, and I figured that I could maybe build off of that. Um I've played plenty of games and read some fiction uh, that in that used uh, elemental metaphysics, mm -hmm. and uh, I tend to enjoy those. I think it adds a lot of color uh, and helps deliver a lot of context to players very quickly. Absolutely. Um, so I decided to go for that angle very early, um, building myself a little elemental wheel about with the. Uh, 
sort of the relationships between the various elements. Oops. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I love it. And, and what I love the most about that is uh, unbeknownst, uh, you know, to us, I use you're developing this and you, you have your your you're developing this in the context of of releasing it. it. I feel like that's a different mindset than developing it to just play around a table. Mm hmm. Kind of, kind of different, uh, differing concepts um, in in scope, and you got to think about what people. Because if it's yours and you're playing around the table, and you're you're the GM and you're hanging out there, you can kind of play around a little bit, sort of a uh, play uh, play a little loose. But if you are looking at it through the eyes of someone else that you don't know, they're going to have a harder time, kind of uh, you know, getting extemporaneous about that. Um, how much of that went into your thought process as you developed this? Well, uh, I can say that my home game that I do in this setting it yeah. definitely has a lot more bells and whistles and uh, playing around than I release on the uh, Age Creators Alliance. Um, I'm not making any assumptions about what books you own. Uh, I, of course, own all of the <laughs> Fantasy Age line. Yeah. Um, I, digital or print. I don't I think I have them all in print, but I haven't been quite that lucky. But uh, I've... Uh, Let's see. Uh, I very much went for a very toolbox sort of uh, building yeah. philosophy. Um, and I try to minimize it with releases on the drive through RPG because I don't want to have to necessarily put it at the bottom of all of the things that, like, if you want to play this adventure, you will need the yeah. basic rule book. You're going to need the beast area. You're going to need the companion. You're going to need this one section in the campaign builder's guide. Uh, oh, and you did buy that PDF Gifts of the Gods that they released six years ago, right? Because we're definitely using that one, too. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> um, and this was also a setting that I always intended to share. Uh, so I wanted to try and throw lots of fun things in, uh, keep it accessible. Everything that's in the basic rule book you can use. There's nothing that, uh, I don't think there's, there shouldn't be anything in the basic rule book that I've specifically said doesn't exist here. Um, yeah. All right. Well, so I, I love that. And I think, you know, it is, um, I think it's a, a unique starting point and, you know, I think I'm imagining at the time you're like, where I, I got to get into that program. When are they going to let me do this? And, uh, you know, and things happen when they happen and uh, when they should happen. And and so I, I, I like listening to your journey of, of development um, because I think it, it is a bit of a of a hint to people who want to get engaged with the Age Creators Alliance. Don't rush it. Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely not. Uh, All right. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about adventure number two. Oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I was going to say, especially because if you're releasing it on the Age Creators Alliance, there's not really a deadline besides the ones you set. So feel free to take your time with them, get them polished. Uh, but do actually release them. That is a problem I have, is uh, I've got it, and it looks great. It's version 1.257683, and I'm still thinking, no, 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 hang on, hang on. Just one more thing. There's one more polishing <laughs> I can get in there. That's right, uh, yeah. I, oh, I know what you mean. I do, too, <laughs> in, in the sense that sometimes perfection can be the enemy of progress, and, uh, you know, and, and I am known worldwide as a perfectionist so i can see um you know i can i'm just kidding uh the uh you know i end up uh i'm what they call a pixel tickler i will sit here and just adjust the pixels until they're just right and then and then it'll all be wrong when i do it and then i have to do it over again but you um have of course published three of uh three titles under the fateoth adventures and we're talking about number two now delve mm -hmm. of the 12 that's got a nice mouthfeel what tell me what that's about Thank you. Uh, Delve of the Twelve is uh, one is the first in a series of adventures that's part of the Teoth Adventures. Um, one of the plans that I have for Viteoth Adventures is that odd numbered adventures are going to be self contained. Uh, you play oh, it, nice. it tells you a story, and then by the end of the evening, the story is told. And then uh, it might tie into some stuff that happens later, but not. But it's like you don't have to play them exactly in order. Um, the even-numbered adventures, however, are all going to be parts of longer campaigns. So, number two here, Delve of the Twelve, is the first in the Greed's Resurrection series. Okay. Uh, the heroes are going to find... Uh, a, the heroes are going to come across uh, a temple that has a bunch of elemental spirits trapped inside it, all of whom seem mm. to be alluding to, to the return of a master. Um, 
and the heroes will have to um, sneak through that temple, meet the various personalities, and maybe some folks who got stuck in there by accident. Uh, and ah. it's it kicks off uh, a much larger adventure that I currently have written and tested, but not laid out at least five adventures for now. I love that. So a couple of different things. So this is sort of a, um, a meet and greet of grave danger. Um, I love that. And um, this is an interesting piece. And I'm, I'm glad that, that you brought that up. I, I really wanted to ask you about, so the, you've got the sort of the axes of, of time, you know, you've got the, I'm doing series, you know, uh, publishing one, two, and three, but then you've got another axis there that is sort of an alternating, like this is a self-contained story and this is going to be a branch that's going to go off in its kind of own direction in that space. Uh, I think that's brilliant. And I think that that is, I do feel like that is a, um, the mark of maybe some advanced development notion. Um, when, when you thought of that, where did you sort of develop that idea or where did that idea come to you as far as uh, de- when you're developing a world like that. That makes sense? No? Oh, I'm not sure if Ren is frozen. Mm. Or not. Yeah, it might be. Oh, yep, yep. Oh, dear. Ren will be yeah. back in just a second. Hello. Hello. Dabs. Oh, there you are. You're back. No worries. Did you hear my question? I'm sorry. I think I cut off uh, halfway through. Um, could you ask it again? Yeah, I, absolutely. Generally speaking, I, I use more than half of the words I need to get a question asked, but I'll say this. Um, the uh, What I like about your development here is you've really not just taken, I'm doing one, two, and three, but you've really thought about the axes of, I'm going to develop these, uh, these standalone, and then I'm going to develop something that allows me to branch off and develop another branch of the storyline of the world, and it just sort of gives you more opportunity to talk about aspects of the of the whole game world that you know people may not be uh people would have to imagine um where did you pull that concept how did that get kind of on the docket um i really wanted to give myself some structure uh i was worried i think that uh, if i was just with every number saying all right this has got to be something completely different it has to be absolutely unique you have to get new people in um, maybe bring some people in that folks have seen before. Um, but, uh, I feel like this gives me, this is, this is sort of more, uh, to help me as well as to give folks something to look forward to, um, so that I can keep thinking of new ideas for the odd numbered adventures, but the even numbered adventures, I, I can make a lot more longer term plan. I love that. And it gives, you know, the storylines that you develop some room to breathe and you know you can kind of alternate that and, and add a whole new you know group of, of uh, villains and conflict and all that i just think it's really brilliant um hey forrest thank you so much Forrest said just ordered the soft cover of cyber slide uh thank god we desperately needed a hard copy for our urban fantasy cyberpunk game thanks this makes me very happy forrest that makes us very happy uh very very glad that you enjoy that um now ren we talked about um, the uh, the Tath Adventures number two, Devil of the Twelve. Now we're going to talk about number three, In the Belly of the Whale Hold. What is this about? I was very proud of that one. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And I'm actually uh, I'm actually very proud of this adventure. Um, I'm trying to set a new standard for myself, uh, which I sure hope I can keep up uh, a little longer. Um, but this one, uh, like the first two adventures I feel, I felt like were pretty solid. I ran them, I've run them of course, and, uh, gotten them tested and run them with a couple of different groups. So I feel like I, that they work out all right. And I've done the same with this one, but this one, I tried to include a lot more art. Uh, I tried to get a bit more of the layout, um, looking a bit nicer. And this is the first one where I start including maps that I have obtained from other sources, uh, ah. besides like generating myself which i which i did with uh number two gotcha gotcha um so so this is great so this is would you say i you know, i'm gonna just check real quick while we're you know let's just do a live so the um all right so is it is it the the largest of the three that you published is it uh because 36 pages only six more pages than second 
Is that reflective of the extra sort of content and maps and things? I think so. Um, I think it also ended up being a bit beefier because uh, this is the first adventure that I included a hard mode for. Uh, so players, uh, it's built for a level range of well, heroes from one to four. Um, but it's the uh, when if you run it normally, it's very friendly to like level like low level characters, level one to two. Um, but uh, I started wanting. Uh, wanting to include some greater challenges for folks who would like them. Yeah. Uh, so even, and uh, especially if like you get to this adventure with your friend, with your friends and everybody's level four already, um, or everybody's okay. like level three and maybe well equipped. Um, so it gives you a, a second sort of way to run the game. Uh, I'd like to say it makes it sound like, it makes it sound like that there's like two whole adventures in there and it kind of is, um, the oh goodness i believe page two has uh an entry on how to adjust the adventure uh for playing in hard mode most nice. of which is pretty simple um but i think a lot of those i think it, those those six extra pages probably came from six extra pages of stat blocks that i included so i got gotcha. yeah what are the characteristics of hard mode exactly um it's uh I think uh, what I did was hard mode in this adventure means that you increase all the target numbers by one. Um, success thresholds for advanced tests increase by three. Mm -hmm. uh, you use the hard mode versions of the stat blocks. Uh, and if the heroes complete the entire adventure on hard mode, um, then they get a little extra experience at the end. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it really yeah, is. It's one of those. It's one of those tabletop video game cross fertilization. <laughs> yeah, uh, that you don't like. I don't know. People have various opinions about them generally, but I think you know it's like any other source of inspiration, right? Um, Absolutely. You know, one thing, one example in another game is uh, I do happen to know that um, the reason we have games now where you can heal faster than you could before. Like if you remember like old school D and D, right. Um, you know, you only, you healed like one hit point a day unless you, you know, had magical healing. Right. And they've kind of softened that with each edition. But I remember reading an essay where one of the inspirations for having, um, the breather, for example, right. Or breather type. Well, we have the breather type mechanic in, in age, right. Um, but it's also, it's also been in D and D, but an essay said that, well, th one of the inspirations for that was halo, right? Mm. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, cause how does, yeah. Cause that's how that works in halo basically, right? Is you have, you have to run and take a rest before you can jump back into things. Um, and that has kind of dominoed down and changed how adventures are paced it's 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 a whole bunch of things that come from that little inspiration and i think that's cool i think the idea of a hard mode for extra bonuses is very interesting and i'm just kind of thinking of different ways to instantiate it um like i would say good job on not getting too crazy with increasing the target numbers because one of the things of course is that age works on a curve so bonuses are a lot more significant than they initially look, right? Um, yeah, good on you. Absolutely good on you. And there's nothing, there's truly nothing I like more than when we start getting into the weeds because I think that it can be difficult when you're a developer and you're talking about all the things that it takes to develop games. Oftentimes, it's really only... In my experience, tabletop roleplay affords this sort of blending of player and developer. Uh, the you know, and the GM sometimes is, even if they're not publishing, they are adding their house rules or they're adjusting based. You know, and and I think that there's no place more than age that 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 gives you more freedom. And I mean, we can culture jam all we want and just blend all kinds of things, um, but there has to be some kind of universal high you know and I, I so i love it and i think that's phenomenal um the both of you just as a as as accomplished developers what i'd like to know is um would you um sign my autograph book and when you're let's say you're starting out you're doing this from the 
the perspective of a, a brand new, like someone's just like, I want to do that. I'm, I'm so excited. I've got to get in there. I've got to do it. What are, what are some like early tips, hints, things that you can share with people so that if they want to get into the age creators lines or anything else that they can kind of use those words of wisdom uh, to, to get them through the process. Learn to write at length consistently. Mm. It is the uh, single biggest hurdle for people doing things um, is you have to be okay with writing five, 10, 20, 30,000 words. And a day. Within, within a limited period of time, even if it's a self-imposed limit. Right. Um, right. You know, so for example, for um, we like freelancers to be able to give us 10,000 words a month. Um, and that is, and we don't, and that's not supposed to be their full capacity. Right. So that is on top of anything else they are doing. Um, so that's, that's the main thing, I think, because everything else um, is a technique you can read about, learn, or it comes from your imagination. Um, but you just need the, you just need the power to habitually write for, you'd write big chunks of text. It makes sense. It is, it is the foundational contribution to all the work that you're doing. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess the other thing too is I, I want to emphasize that, like, I don't mean that more text is better, right? Like still Fair, write yeah. efficiently. So the other thing is to, um, is basically your first draft should actually be kind of like three drafts, right? Because there's writing the raw text. Um, and then there's a technical edit. Um, and then there's a stylistic edit. Um, so the technical ed edit would be, you know, spelling, grammar, things like that, right? And the stylistic edit um, is to tighten everything up. Um, especially look at the beginning of your major sections because often uh, a lot of writing there is extraneous because you're warming up conceptually. You're mm -hmm. kind of getting your brain into your fingers and people don't need to read that part. Um, so often, like seriously, I tell everybody, everybody uh, listening right now, I want you to pop open a book with a lengthy uh, chapter intro and ask yourself how much of it could have been excised. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. Because the idea is that you hide your process and produce something. You produce something that is a pure product of what you wish to express um, without getting in the way of it. I love and that. That's no, what I think. I think that that's great. And uh, an exercise that many writers use, it's one that I do, is take that concept and just as an exercise, boil it down to a tweet. It is one of the most excruciating processes you will go through. But I mean, you know, there's there's a kind of a spectrum there. I want I want to switch to Ren. Um, talk to me about what advice you give to people who are just starting out uh, as a reflection of what you experienced yourself or as something that you see often in people who are, are kind of uh, learning the ropes. Uh, well, I, I will have to uh, echo Malcolm uh, with a movie quote from a movie I do not remember the name of, uh, but the key to writing is to write. <laughs> you got to do it. Just just start doing it. Just start writing it down, and then you'll have to cut it up later. Um, let's see. Uh, it is never too late, and it is never too early uh, to get started. Um, let's see. If you're writing for yourself, uh, of course you don't have deadlines, but it's not a bad idea to make some for yourself or maybe make some goals for yourself. Oh, you um, have one deadline. <laughs> one ultimate deadline. That yeah. is, that Everybody's is deadline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Emphasis on dead. Point. Get it? Uh, no, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, oh, it's, 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 it's writers write always throw mama from the train. Yeah. Sorry, Stan, we were just talking about that movie. <laughs> That's the movie I was talking about before the show with Billy uh -huh. Crystal and Danny DeVito. Oh, yeah. Throw mama yeah. from the train. <laughs> yeah. You know, so one of the things I note about the tabletop uh, 
RPG community is that we all uh, think along the same lines. We all get along. It's all a very harmonious uh, sort of uni mind. Um, I'm kidding, but uh, but you know, Stan's always there. You hear like mm, maybe not, uh, but uh, so <laughs> but any Stan's other, uh, you know, Ren. I, I think that you know when you look at publishing through a publisher's um, licensing through you know kind of a program like the H Creators Alliance. Um, each one is a little different or a lot different. Um, I th- what is it? So when you're looking at, um, when you're evaluating which one you want to utilize, you really took it from the, I love this. I love this game. I love fantasy ages is, is where my heart's at. And that's why I want to do this. Um, have you, did you look at any other, um, publishing sort of, uh, resources out there? Um, you know, did you consult with anybody who has published, in any capacity, like how, how did you kind of psych yourself up or were you just like, this is how I'm doing it. And I don't care how painful it is. I actually did. Strangely enough, I actually did have a, a method for this. Um, when I was, when we were, especially when we were, when it was coming up along t- uh, to the final like days when age creators Alliance would, a- would actually launch. Uh, yeah. I started listening to a podcast. Uh, oh goodness. I think it's called, it's called the forge. Um, it's by uh, a couple of folks who were actually on the same podcasting network that I was on, uh, D20 Radio Network. Uh, and they talk about um, a content community pro- a community content program for the Genesis RPG. Um, and they get folks, uh, they actually like go through the things that people are releasing and they bring folks on who wrote stuff and they talk about it. Um, they made a podcast about that creative uh, commu- that community content program. Um, so while the games are very different, uh, I felt like that there was still some very valuable insight to grab there, and there was. Uh, there were a couple of trends that appeared. Um, there were uh, some bits of uh, advice that I snagged uh, while I was listening uh, and also working. Uh, I was lucky enough to be working in a place where I can listen to podcasts while I work. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I was I was kind of doing research while I was also on the job. Uh, it was very helpful. Um it was definitely not our community content program, uh, but I felt like there was still kernels of truth to grab from it. Um, and as for uh, other programs, uh, I've also been looking at uh, Pathfinder Unlimited uh, because I've been playing Pathfinder since like 2012. Of course, yeah. Beautiful, uh, yeah, yeah. This is a different Pathfinder that they're using right now, but um, considering it as well, I have I have some friends who, work over, who are working over there, so it's... Um, but this was definitely like the... Uh, the first one that I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my name out there and it's going to be great. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the interesting thing as well is even in just sort of talking with you about the evolution of your work and what you have done, you know, the, the idea is the more you do, the more you can do the capacity you will build and the opportunity to sort of branch out and, and to, you know, and anything you do subsequent to the first thing is going to, be better it's going to improve it's going to be you know and and one of the interesting things is and that's you know with all things that involve sort of a public eye and, and engagement you look at even thursday we did not start out this pro i mean i know that you know it's hard to believe but uh but the idea is the more you do it the more you can do it and the more opportunities that come up and so um i really love to see that and i also like to see that auden's here um auden usually hangs out in the background um auden is the uh uh uh, the person we're working with over at the um, Facebook group for the uh, for the expanse, and we kind of talked about some of that stuff that's coming up. I'm really looking forward to being able to share more info and details about that. But listen, friends, we only have an hour or thereabouts to to hang out and to talk with you all. Um, what we want to do is hang out all day and just have conversation about tabletop role play. Uh, I, I love it. And I especially love when we have opportunities to kind of get meta and to talk about sort of the crunchy pieces of what it means to develop, because I think it really does inform gameplay and it allows people, it just changes the way the mind is working and affords more creativity and agency. And I think that that's really, uh, really, really awesome. Um, I know, Jahan, um, I'm going to miss you too. Uh, but you know, we'll be back. This is, uh, we do this every Thursday, nearly every Thursday, sometimes, you know, um, and, uh, we are of course wishing our, uh, beloved Owen. Well, uh, he is, uh, on the mend, but just needs a little time to, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so now 
this is the part, and I, I made this promise um, um, via you know uh, our show notes that you two would fight to the death. So I'm going to get the music going. If you could start, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, no, no fighting, only friendship. Um, while we um, wrap up here, is there anything, Malcolm, do you have anything cooking in the world that people should be paying attention to, whether it's related specifically to your work with Green Ronin, or if you've got something out there in the world that they can kind of. Something out there in the world. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I am working on a non-age game um, that I mentioned before. That non is an update of the it is a uh, planetary romance, sword and planet kind of deal. Um, wow. But sort of working from the premise of what that would be like if that literature was founded now with our current understanding of science. Um, okay, and lack of the problematic you know and lack of the problematic bits that are in Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, I see, I see. Filtered and, uh, uh, for your filter. Yeah. You know. Uh and of course Cthulhu Awakens um is we're ramping going, up for some good stuff there, yeah. Yeah, there's you know arts coming in and I'm working on a few supplements for it. I'm working on an adventure set in the 1960s right now that I'm going to be excited to show you. Um, and there's a quick start, and that is that is set in the 40s. And it's one of the neat things about Cthulhu Awakens because we cover the period from, like, the classic Lovecraftian period to the modern day um, in the game. Uh, and I guess that's it. I mean, there's on the horizon for modern age... Uh, there's powers, there's more adventures, um, a couple of other things that I'm not sure I can talk about, but, uh, but yes, stuff is happening. Um, oh, I yeah. have, I have ideas for stuff all the time. Like, um, just the, I'll give you, I'll give you a mechanic, I'll give you all a mechanic to play with. Um, so, uh, over in, um, enemies and allies, I, uh, had a mechanic in the, um, in the kind of cops and robbers section uh, for something called heat, which is uh, kind of like a, a relationship bond that uh, kind of can be used against you because it, it's how much interest the law or a rival organization has in you. Right. And your heat meter um, measures kind of, you know, how much advantage they have when it comes to that or how interested they are. And they, and you know, if, if heat's on you, it can be used to spend stunts that are aversive to you. So I've been thinking of some kind of fantasy deep cover espionage game. Oh. Um, because I've been watching Andor, which is this great <laughs> Star Wars spinoff series. Um, but, you know, uh, if you remember the FFG game Midnight, it did that thing where the Dark Lord wins, right? But I was thinking of something with a little less trad fantasy a little more urban um but the idea of having these meters uh for aversive relationships like that uh is something that's interested me um i was thinking and i was thinking the spy sense you would have these bond meters for heat and uh there was a, and for equipment and for some other things so the idea is that the stunts would determine what equipment you might have on hand that's otherwise unspecified um like you know fortunately i have this hidden dagger i spend yay many stunt points um you know it, you can have a bond used against you or you can have one that will like expand your networks of trust um ah, yeah. so using and this is all bootstrapping off the relationship mechanics um in modern age but essentially we use that more generally uh, and we run it according to whatever descriptor we assign to it. And we go beyond like this person loves this person and this person hates this person. Right. Right. Um, but the relationship rules, the bonds can be really useful for that kind of thing, for that kind of um, creative play with the system. That's why we expanded what they can do in Cthulhu Awakens. Um, that's why um, Fantasy Age Trojan War uh uses bonds for divine relationships so uh like if you are homebrewing things play around with that idea and see what you get 
I like it. So there's a little there's a little gift for you, um, a, a little uh, uh, early Christmas present. Um, because much like the department stores, we start Christmas now. No, I'm kidding. We don't. We don't. Um, we don't do that. But um, what I like about this really is that Malcolm has inadvertently shared with you the code, the key, the the entryway into his brain. Talk about media that you love, that you want him to then incorporate into modern age. Because if he likes, you know, like you got to create that, like, oh, Malcolm, I'm watching this program. That <laughs> I really love the blah, blah, blah. And yeah. So uh, thank you for that, uh, for all of that. Uh, Ren, anything that you, let's talk about where people can find you. Let's talk about um, any place you want to send them. Of course, we've got links and stuff to the drive through RPG stuff. And I'm imagining now that, um, you know, of our millions of listeners, you know, uh, 75% of them uh, are, are right now buying all of your stuff. So congratulations well, for thank that. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and so I you need, like, uh, yeah, let, let's talk about um, uh, like, can we uh, find you on Twitter? Can we follow you on, um, you know, uh, LinkedIn? <laughs> LinkedIn. Oh, man. <laughs> at, uh, at gender underscore fury. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I don't use it very often. Uh, I technically am on LinkedIn if you really want to find me there. Uh, I'm also under the name Ren Lebeau. Um And of course, you can find me on Drive Through RPG and Ren Lebeau and use that to find my, the adventures that I've written. Uh, I've got more in the I've got more in the pipeline. Um, okay. Nothing. Uh, working on I've... number four right now. Well, that is awesome. And I, I had this moment of thinking about the work that you're doing and and you know, you, you speak so well to the process in a way that is like an invitation for people to, to dive in and sort of explore that space in their mind where they're the developer. And I think that that's an important opportunity to onboard people. Um, would you be willing, you know, to come back and chat with us a bit about your process and also maybe in a more of like a, a format where maybe we grab a few other uh, contributors to the H creators line. So we do a panel of some kind and talk a bit about the process and, and really get into the nuts and bolts of, of building your space and, uh, and offering folks tools to make it a little, you know, mental tools that will get them uh, sort of closer to their goals. Absolutely. I can also point folks to the places where I get all my maps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, now also, I know, um, one of the things that I, I really appreciate about you, Ren, is the, um, it, you know, you are very good about recognizing that it, it takes more than just you. Like, I mean, you, you are also marshalling resources that are created by some other folks. You want to do any shout outs? Ooh, uh, my, well, the one I've been using the most right now is, uh, good folks call who call themselves Zay and Peku. Uh, they make, uh, fantasy maps. They're on Patreon. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've also been getting a lot of their uh, ship maps for Hyperdrive Fleet, which is on Patreon. I believe it's on Patreon. Hyperdrive Fleet. Uh, okay. Zay and Peku, by the way, is spelled C Z E and P E K U. Perfect. That's exactly what I thought it would be. We're gonna. Uh, oh, good. Duke, <laughs> Duke's familiar as well, but we'll provide links in the show notes. But you've got also you've got folks. You've done some art. You've got uh, interior art by. Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Comerci, Comerci, is that right? Is it Comerci? Uh, yes, Com I, I, I believe it's Comerci. Um, okay, Comerci. Uh, he, uh, he he provides lovely stock art on Drive Through RPG. Beautiful. Um, I also have gotten commissions from my good friend Levely Weil, uh, who you can find at bonyfish.net. Um, they are taking commissions and they do excellent work. I definitely intend to commission them later. Um, and I and, love that name. Uh, it's a yeah. Like it just has such a good mouthfeel. I love it. Thank you, Duke, for the spelling there. Yeah. Oh, well, um, you're a Duke. Thank you. Uh, and finally, my friend Joe Hartman, uh, who provided the cover art for Vitaleth Adventures number two. Nice. Absolutely. That's that's fantastic. Um, you know, it takes a village to uh, create a, a tabletop role play experience. Um, and uh, you know, I want to thank you both for hanging out today. Uh, two really great opportunities to explore age i think that there are um you know this this particular episode is special to me because i think that the idea of creating tools to diversify your gameplay and then also stepping out of the i'm just i'm playing the game and and being a developer i think it just really lends itself well to just a, a an increased enjoyment of the whole genre so thank you both so much um everybody else have a great day i want to thank everybody in the chat that's been hanging out encourage people who are watching this on demand uh, check the chat because the chat 
has links and all kinds of good stuff um, and uh, you know show notes as well. Now, if you've got a notion or idea, something you'd like to share, uh, you've got a compliment, you've got a question, uh, any other compliments, um, or you want to share some thoughts about uh, your experience as a developer, um, or ask some questions of our experienced developers, send a note to Let's Play at Green dot com and i will endeavor to ignore it um i will not actually i will try to get to it um the avalanche of email sometimes tries to claim my time but uh i uh, i get it back i do um again thank you you two uh, absolute pleasure uh to hang out and we will do so again all right everybody have a good week bye-bye